Okay, thank you. All right, good to have you here and those of you uh, joining us online uh, Sunday before Thanksgiving. Of course, going to have a, a Thanksgiving theme this morning and uh, now all the preliminary stuff is done, right? Done with songs, done with that. So now I can now I can get to the fun, the fun part, the relaxing part. Not really, but so think of all the ways you could finish this statement. I will be so thankful when I will be so thankful when my check comes in the mail. I get out of the hospital, probably Jimmy right now. I will be so thankful when I finally, all caps, retire. When I'm feeling better. I will be so thankful when the election is over. And by the way, it is not over. Okay, regardless of what you're hearing, it is not over. Uh, I will be so thankful when COVID is over. You know, sadly, there's probably some people that are even thinking, I will be so thankful when Thanksgiving is over. That's horrible, isn't it? But there are some people, I'm sure, that have that thought. But what about now? Are you thankful now? Not, I will be thankful, but am I thankful now, today, this moment? We are supposed to be, aren't we? We know that in our heads. The Bible has a lot to say about giving thanks to God. Thanksgiving is only in the Bible 29 times. But thanks is in the Bible over a hundred times. That is nothing, though, compared to rejoice. The word rejoice is in 240 verses. And the word praise is in 259 verses. And, of course, it's hardly surprising that the book of Psalms has the majority of those. In fact, the book of Psalms is called the book of praise, and it has 150 verses out of the 259 uh, that have praise in it. What's interesting to me is how the book of Psalms ends, and I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 146. Psalm 146. If you're using a pew Bible, uh, it is on page 485. But I want us to look at Psalm 146, page 485. Psalm 146, I'll give you a minute to find it. Psalm 146 begins with, praise ye the Lord. Psalm 146 ends with, praise ye the Lord. Psalm 147 begins with, praise ye the Lord. Psalm 147 ends with, Praise ye the Lord. So 148 begins with Psalm 146 and 147 and 148 and 149 and 150. All of those psalms begin with and end with praise ye the Lord. That's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, some people feel that that's uh, kind of those five psalms kind of sum up all the other ones. And they all start and end with praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord comes from the Hebrew word that sounds like hallelujah. Okay, I don't know Hebrew, so I just would have to say it in English anyway. Hallelujah, so praise means praise ye the Lord. So last five psalms certainly are what we would call the, the hallelujah chorus of the Old Testament. This morning I want us to focus in on just one psalm, Psalm 147. I'm not going to cover all five of these, 146 through 150, and uh, we're going to spend time in Psalm 147. Please follow along as I read verses 1 through 6. So Psalm 147, beginning with verse 1, Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is comely. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. He healeth the broken in heart, and bindeth up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord, and of great power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord 
lifteth up the meek, he casteth the wicked down to the ground. This morning, we're going to just look at this psalm. Uh, we're going to look at a number of other verses, but the, the title this morning is Praising God for His Greatness and His Goodness. That's kind of the theme of this chapter, is the greatness and goodness of God, so we're going to uh, dissect that here in a little bit, but uh, let's ask the Lord to bless our time in, in His Word. Father, we uh, thank You that You are uh, praiseworthy. Uh, we thank You for Your many attributes that set you apart from us. Uh, you are the creator, we are the created, and so you are worlds apart from who we are. And uh, Lord, we thank you that you're great. Uh, we thank you that you're good. And we certainly recognize that we can't begin to exhaust the topic of your greatness uh, or your goodness in a sermon in a series of sermons, really, in a, in a lifetime. They're, they're immense. Uh, and yet, uh, we're thankful that uh, this psalm reminds us, gives us some specifics, some details uh, that show us you're great and that show us you're good. And so, Lord, I pray that uh, we would take this time now and just put aside uh, the cares that we may have come in the building with that we would put aside the plans that we may have for uh, the afternoon, that we would put aside even the concerns of uh, our nation and the future of it, and that we would just focus on what your word says, and that we would not just uh, hear things with our ears and, and think of things with our, our minds, but that we would let our, our hearts be affected and our hearts be changed. We uh, thank you for your goodness in giving us your word so that we can know these truths about you. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Psalm begins, I already mentioned, begins with praise ye the Lord and ends with praise ye the Lord. There's also the, the format of the psalm, and maybe you have a Bible that breaks it up into paragraphs. Maybe you don't, but there's, there's three sections. Uh, verses 1 through 6 form a section. Uh, 7 through 12 form another section. And then 12, or 7 through 11, I'm sorry, then 12 through 20, uh, a third section. And uh, Stephen Cole points out that each section, verse number 1, verse number 7, and verse number 12, all begin with a call to praise. Verse 1, praise ye the Lord. Verse 7, sing unto the Lord. Uh, verse number 12, praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. So that each, each section, and it's good when you read the Bible and study the Bible, that you think of it in paragraphs, and, and you think of it in, in units, and there are three units. And then he points out this, each section ends in a contrast. Uh, verse number six, the Lord lifteth up the meek, casts down the wicked. Uh, verses 10 and 11, the second section, uh, delights not in one thing, but delights in something else. And then verses 19 through 20 uh, talk about the difference between uh, God's people and those that are not God's people. And each of the sections also talk about the greatness and the goodness of God. But instead of greatness of God, section one, goodness of God, section one, greatness of God, section two, goodness of God, section two, greatness, I'm gonna, we're going to kind of lump them together. So I'm not going to follow uh, the psalm straight through. Um, a little easier to keep one topic at a time. And actually, there's way too much here to cover uh, in depth, verse by verse. But we're going to start with the greatness of God. But one other thing, kind of in the way of background, is Psalm 146 through 150, these last five psalms, were probably written when the Jews came back from captivity. Okay, they were, they were exiled in Babylon for 70 years. Daniel went as a young boy and lived there to be an old man. Uh, but they were released. They got to come back to Jerusalem. So these last five psalms, some people say psalms of David. No, David was long gone. Uh, they really point to coming back to Jerusalem after an extended captivity. And it's like, well, 
Pastor, we didn't come back from any kind of captivity. But the word pictures that are used here, uh, I think, really help us as we get into them and as we think about them. They kind of, okay, God is good. Yep, we get it. Check that. God is great. Yep. But it gives us word pictures that we can really kind of wrap our uh, minds around a little bit better. So let's, number one on your outline there, uh, we need to praise God for his greatness. Praise God for his greatness. And the psalmist points out three different ways uh, that God demonstrates his greatness. Number, or letter A, God's greatness is seen in his wisdom. We see that in verses 4 and 5. God's greatness is seen in his wisdom. Verse number 4, he telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. How many stars are there? <laughs> we don't really know, right? Uh, every time they make a new, fancier telescope that can reach out there further and further, they find more stars. So we really don't know how many there are. Scientists estimate that there are between 100 and 200 billion, I've even seen 300 billion, billion stars, one to 200, we'll say 200 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. One galaxy. And that there could be another 100 billion galaxies. All right, we, we can't even hardly put our arms around billion, much less multiply billions by billions. So if you're curious how many stars there are, uh, take the number one and write anywhere from 22 to 23 to 24 zeros behind it. And if you know what that is, and you can put, you know, you, that makes sense to you, uh, talk to me after the service. Yeah, that's too big. Our, our minds, we, we don't get that. We, uh, you know, septillion. So God not only knows the number, he calleth them all by their names. You know, I, I had this thought. Is it, okay, this is name one billion and one, this is one billion and two, this is one. I, I don't think so. Uh, you know, think of how hard it would be to come up with billions of names. I'd have a hard time with a thousand. I think if I took, you know, all the best baby book names, you know, took one of the, took a bunch of those, and then went into a you know, a, a book on flowers and took all of those names and then went into animals and then went into spiders and then went into fish and you took all the names of all, then you could have maybe, what, a thousand, maybe two thousand? How would you ever get to a, a trillion or sept, I don't know what the numbers are, you know, septrillion or sept, whatever, quintillion, you know, all these different numbers. Uh, God has them named. That's, that's mind-boggling to us. God can have and does have a name for every one of them. Look at the end of verse 5. His understanding is infinite. His understanding has no limits. That's what infinite means. God's understanding has no end. Again, how do we even grasp that? He knows the numbers of the stars. He knows the number of the grains of sand. Think about that. You know, you want to keep a, a child busy, give him a shovel full of sand and say, here, come, come, let me know how many grains are in here, you know? That would take a long time, right? Uh, I was thinking that when I get old and I'm in a nursing home and I'm 145 and I'm still voting, that maybe I will come grains of sand. But... Just making sure you're paying, paying attention. Uh, he knows the numbers of stars. He knows the number of grains of sand. He knows the numbers of the hairs on our head. He knows the number of the thoughts within our head. And he knows the number of that for every person that has ever lived and ever will live. That's incredible. He knows everything that has happened he knows everything that will happen. He knows everything that could have happened. You know, there is no limit. There is no end to God's understanding. His understanding is 
infinite. And so that's, you, could, you could occupy your life trying to think about the things that God would know or have, have to know. God's greatness is seen in his wisdom, secondly, letter B. God's greatness is seen in his provision for creation. God's greatness is seen in his provision for creation. We have verses 8 and 9. God who covereth the heaven with clouds, who prepareth rain for the earth, who maketh grass to grow upon the mountains. He giveth to the beast his food and to the young ravens which cry. We're not going to turn there, but Psalm 104 talks about God feeding the young lions and, the, and, and that animals wait on God for their food. Uh, Jesus in Matthew 6 reminds us of that truth. I, I have uh, Matthew 6, 26 on your outline there for you. Uh, Jesus said, Behold the fowls of the air, the birds. They sow not, neither do they reap. Yet, I lost my spot, but I know the verse. Uh, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. You know, we've joked about that before. You don't see little birds out there in a the little garden with a a hoe working up the soil and then a rake smoothing things out and then making a furrow and planting seeds. They don't, they don't do that. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. God feeds the fowls of the heirs. How valuable are sparrows? I wasn't sure if I was going to bring this up or not. Some of you might think ill of your pastor after this, but when I was a kid, we didn't like sparrows. My dad paid me a nickel. For every sparrow I shot with my BB gun, I would lay in the chicken coop floor and provided I didn't miss and make BBs ricochet around the chicken coop, which is not a good thing when you're laying in there. But I shot sparrows and, you know, it was a win-win. We got, except for the sparrow, of course, but we got rid of, you know, the other songbirds. Sparrows will wreck nests of other songbirds. So we got rid of the sparrows. I got a nickel. And we fed the cats, and so we're just happy, you know. Uh, sparrows are not highly thought of by a lot of people. Uh, Matthew 10, 29. Jesus said, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? What's a farthing? It really doesn't matter. What, what that's equivalent to, you know, one-sixteenth of a penny or whatever. really doesn't matter. But two of them for a farthing. Then Jesus said in another spot, Luke 12, 6, five sparrows are sold for two farthing. Now, if you're awake, and if you're not having to take your shoes off to do math, you're like, okay, um, if two sparrows makes equals one farthing, then two farthings would get me four. But Jesus said five. Is Jesus bad at math? No. Sparrows were so insignificant. You've heard of a baker's dozen, right? 13th donut, you get three. You didn't have to get a dozen sparrows. You only had to get four, and they threw in an extra one. You got the fifth one free. Buy four, get the fifth one free. So they were not valuable, is the point. Sparrows were not valuable. They were not highly thought of. And yet, I didn't give you all of Matthew 10, 29. Here's how it ends. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Father, a sparrow does not die. Every nickel I earned, God knew about that sparrow. Sparrow doesn't die without God's knowledge of that. And the point, of course, is if God cares for sparrows. Uh, Matthew 6 also reminds us that if God cares for the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you or feed you, O ye of little faith? And so we, we need to, when, when we think of God's care for his creation, we need to remember for us, so much more does he care for us. We are made in the image of God. So God's greatness is seen in his wisdom. God's greatness is seen as provision for creation. And thirdly, 
God's greatness is seen in his power over creation. God's greatness is seen in his power over creation. Uh, God's power is mentioned in verse 5. Great is our Lord and of great power, but it doesn't really elaborate. It doesn't say much about it. So we drop down to verse 15. Verse 15 says, He sendeth forth his commandment upon the earth, or upon earth, his word runneth swiftly. So the point, I believe here, the, the meaning here is God commands the earth, and it happens. God's earth does what God asks it to do. God's earth is not like stubborn people like us. God says, snow, verse 16, he giveth snow like wool. God says, snow, to the heavens, and guess what? Snow comes. God scatters the hoarfrosts like ashes. You know what hoarfrost is, right? Those cool mornings where the, where the frost just sticks on everything. It's beautiful. Sunshine, awesome. God does that. Verse number 17. He casteth forth his ice like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? God gives snow. It's God's. God gives ice. God gives the hoarfrost. God gives the cold. So remember that when you're, you know, scraping off your car and complaining. God's the one who gives those things. Ice belongs to him. And then verse number 18. But spring comes. He sendeth out his word and melteth them. God brings spring. We're not even in winter yet. I was thinking about spring. Spring, sorry, I shouldn't do that. Some of you love winter. That's good. I, I do too. I love the fire and I love, you know, those kind of things. But God sends his word and melts them. Melts them. The ice and the snow. And then he causes the wind to blow, the waters to flow, and a fishing I go. Just like some of you, right? <laughs> That's what happens in spring. Winds blow, waters flow, and a fishing we go. And so God is in control of his creation. Probably my favorite verse, and I have it there on the sheet for you, uh, Job 38, 35. God says to Job, Canst thou send lightnings that they may go and say unto thee, Here we are. Here's my paraphrase. Hey, Job, does lightning come up to you and say, Where do you want us to strike? Think about that. That's what that verse means. Lightning, some, we're scared to death that if we're in our right minds, we should be. You know, don't stand on a golf course with a, you know, a golf club sticking up in the air in a lightning storm, or I'm going to climb up on top of a mountain. You know, when we were out, out with, been to different national parks and we've climbed some high things, and as you get to the top, there are always signs, do not be up here in a thunderstorm. You know, you can get struck. But God, lightning comes to God and says, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? Who do you want me to hit? God has power over his creation. We see God's greatness in his infinite wisdom and his provision for creation and his power over creation. But this psalm also, Psalm 147, talks about, number two, we should praise God for his goodness. There are, there are three different ways. We're only uh, really going to get to two of them. But God's goodness is demonstrated, uh, letter A, first of all, to the hurting. Verses 2 and 3. God's goodness is to the hurting. Verse number 2, the Lord doth build up Jerusalem. I mentioned that the psalm was probably written after the return. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. 
context, of course, people are coming back, but so the, the out, they were in Babylon, and they went to Babylon over the course of three different times, and they were scattered all over, but God gathered up the outcast. He knew where they were. Uh, he knew what was happening to them. Keep, keep your finger here. Uh, I want you to turn back to Psalm 137. Psalm 137, just kind of a reminder of what the people in, and, and just a smidgen, of what the people in Babylon went through. Psalm 137, verse 1, that's uh, page 482 if you're using a pew Bible. Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. They are in a faraway land. They're in Babylon. They think about Zion. They weep. Verse 2 says, they hang, We hanged our harps on the willows in the midst thereof. There was no desire to sing. There was no desire for music. Verse number 3, For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. They're in a faraway land and they are being mocked. Sing about your great God. And, of course, verse number four, how? How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? We're captive. Uh, they, were, they were captive in a strange land. They were captive for their sin. But their attitude was, we can't sing. Uh, we, we can't praise God in a faraway land. We have sinned against him and we get what we deserve. And so they, they were mocked by those that had carried them away captive. God has not changed. God still gathers the outcasts. You know, there are some of you that uh, you don't have a relationship with certain people in your family because of what you believe. They have, they have kind of cast you off. Uh, they don't agree with what you believe. And so you're cast off. You're, you're an outcast in your own family. Can I remind you, Psalm 27, verse 10, there on your sheet, Psalm 27, verse 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. You can be cast off by your family. You can be cast off by your friends. You can be ostracized from them. But the Lord will take you up. Back to Psalm 147. Psalm 147. Not only does God gather together the outcasts, Subpoint number two there, he healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. We see that in verse three. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Isn't that great? You know, sometimes we think and we say, no one really knows what I'm going through. No one really knows how I feel. That's not true. God does. God knows those that are broken hearted. God knows those that are hurting and need their hearts healed. Uh, bindeth up their wounds. Uh, most commentators suggest, and I'm going to treat it that way, that bindeth up their wounds has to do with healing the heart. It's not necessarily physical wounds like Jimmy's foot. It's God heals the broken heart by binding up that broken heart. And, and Psalm 61, verses 1 and 2, uh, carries that same thought. This is Psalm 61. Jesus actually quoted it in the New Testament, but it was a prophecy of what the ministry of Jesus would be like. And Psalm, or Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, the Spirit of the Lord. So Jesus said this, he spoke this in the temple. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up 
the broken heart. So there it kind of uses the same verb, binding and heart, both together. Uh, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives. It goes on, it ends with, to comfort all that mourn. You know, you've been through some things, I've been through some things where uh, they, were, they were so difficult and but so uh, intimate and so um, so challenging that, that you really didn't feel you could you could share with anybody else but you can share it with God and God wants us to share it with him Psalm 34 verse 18 the Lord is nigh the Lord is near unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. I'm, I am so thankful. There's some times I've shared one with you. We went through something with my youngest daughter, uh, and it was dark, and it was hard, and we didn't, we didn't feel we could really tell a lot of people. And yet we, we could have this stubborn trust in God's word that says, God is near. We're brokenhearted. God is near. We need to trust that God is is near. Jesus in Hebrews 4.15, and again, you don't need to turn there, but Hebrews 4.15 reminds us that we have a high priest. We have Jesus who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, and Jesus cares. Jesus cares because Jesus knows what it was like to be rejected. Jesus knew that feeling. Uh, Isaiah 53, I have there on your outline, Isaiah 53, 3 and 4, verse uh, 7 as well. He, Jesus, before he came, prophesied about him, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. It was for us that he was doing these things, and yet we esteem him stricken, smitten of God and, afflict, and afflicted. Verse number seven, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Jesus went through rejection. Jesus went through affliction. Don't say no one can ever understand. Jesus understood, and Jesus bore it Jesus know what it's about? Think of some of the songs that we sing. Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth and song? As the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long, does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me and my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks? Is it aught to him? Does he see? Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days grow weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. And, and that's what we need to count on. If our hearts remain broken, it's because we don't bring our hearts to him. We don't bring our broken heart to him. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to bring our cares to him. Another song, I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. We see God's goodness to the hurting, letter B. We see God's goodness to the humble. God's goodness to the humble. Verse number six. The Lord lifteth up the meek. The Lord lifteth up the meek. Who are the meek? The meek are the afflicted, the humble, the needy, the oppressed. What does God do for the meek? He does what they cannot do for themselves. They cannot lift up themselves. He lifts them up and he helps them. He takes that load from them. Matthew 11, 28, 29, some wonderful verses. Jesus says to those with burdens, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest 
unto your souls. God lifts up the meek. Verse number 11. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. The Lord takes pleasure in them that fear him. Who fears God? You know, a, a, an indictment on our society right now, Paul wrote in Romans, there is no fear of God before their eyes. That seems to be a general consensus of the people as a whole. There is no fear of God, but we are. God takes pleasure in those that fear God. Those that fear God are the humble. Those that have a proper view of themselves and a proper view of God. Those that know God knows everything. Everything they have ever done. I don't know if I told you this, Jim. One of the things when I talked to, to Bernie, when in retrospect, he was you know, four days away from dying. I told Bernie, I said, you know what? You need to realize this. Every sin that you have ever committed, and even the ones you have forgotten about, God knows. And those that fear God understand that about God. Those who fear God also understand that God is holy and a, a holy and just judge that hates sin and that they do not deserve to be with him. They deserve to be judged. Who fears God? Those who hopes in God's mercy. Again, the humble, those who have the right view of God and the right view of themselves. Uh, those hope in God's mercy who recognize it is God's heaven. God sets the rules of heaven. God gets to decide who comes in or not. And they do not deserve, the humble understand, they don't deserve to be there. The humble understand that there is an escape in heaven. It's not a matter of weighing out the good and the bad. It's a matter of, I have sinned. I need God's mercy. There is nothing I can do to get rid of my sin debt. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. That's, that's the attitude. We need to have the attitude of the prodigal that comes to God and says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. That, that's the prodigal son had one goal in mind and it wasn't his belly. It was, I need mercy from my father. And that's how we need to look at God is that we need mercy. The humble understand that they need mercy. Do you fear God? Do you hope in God's mercy? If so, God takes pleasure in you. He, he is pleased with you. Think about what the verse doesn't say. I'm glad the verse doesn't say, the Lord taketh pleasure in them that are rich. Whew, you'd be in trouble. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that are beautiful or handsome. Whoops. Uh, the Lord taketh pleasure in them that are smart and well-educated. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that are talented. You know what's beautiful about this verse? Any one of us, anyone and everyone can fear God. Anyone and everyone can hope in God's mercy. And so we can be thankful. The Lord can take pleasure in any one of us if we are humble and come to him in his way. The truth is that not everyone fears God. We have that reminder at the end of verse 6. Look back at verse 6. Lord lifteth up the meek. He casteth the wicked down to the ground. And of course we know from the New Testament and the Old Testament that God does far more than just cast the wicked to the literal physical ground. Psalm 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Matthew 25, 41, then shall he, Jesus, say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil, and his angels. Revelation 20, 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God 
resists the proud. God will judge the proud. The proud will be cast down. God lifts up the meek, but God, but not everyone is meek. Not everyone is humble. Not everyone will come to God, God's way. And so really, you're one of two kind of people. You here listening, you listening online. You're either meek and have come to God, God's way, or you are wicked. And we categorize wicked different ways. Oh, if you do this, you're wicked. Oh, if you do that, you know, if you're just... If you're just a normal guy that just doesn't want to have anything to do with God, you're not wicked. Yeah, you are. <laughs> you're a rebel against God. You know, God gives us every breath, every heartbeat. You will walk out this door only because God keeps your body going. God gives us everything. And there are people that are a heartbeat away from hell, and they need to understand that God casts down the wicked. But of all the things we ought to praise God for, salvation should be number one on our list. The disciples were excited. They were, came back to Jesus. They were cast and they said, wow, the demons, listen to us. Jesus said, and I have this verse, Luke 10, 20 on your sheet, notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth that we have a no-so of salvation, that we can know whether our names are written there. We sing the song, is my name written there? We're thankful that we can know that because of what Jesus did for us. I thank you that it's not by works of righteousness that we have done. It's not our efforts, but it's what Jesus did for us. Thank you. For sending him. Thank you that he willingly and lovingly died. Thank you that he took uh, the sin payment that we deserve, that he took it upon himself, and that he paid it so that we could be forgiven and that we could have mercy. And uh, Lord, I, I thank you for that. I pray for each one of us that we could would consider first and foremost, do we fear you and have, do we hope in your mercy? Have we trusted in your mercy the way that uh, we should? And then, Lord, I pray that we would be thankful uh, because of your loving forgiveness and salvation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before uh, Joyce comes, just a couple of thoughts. Joyce, you're going to come one more time, press a button right on the last one. You, you can make your way up here. Um, just a couple of thoughts. What should we do in light of what we have heard? Jesus said, rejoice if your names are written in heaven. So first and foremost, is your name written in heaven? If it's not, I, I would love to talk to you. I would love to talk to you. Those of you online, shoot me an email. Uh, I'd be glad to talk to you. Second, are you a thankful person? God's children. Yes, even God's children, whose names are written in the book of life, whose names are written there, we can become grumbling, we can become complaining, we can, we can focus on the wrong things. And I would just encourage you to meditate on the greatness and the goodness of God and how undeserving we are to be forgiven. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. 253, I invite you to stand. 253, turn your eyes on Jesus. Thank you.